Hi, everybody. This is Greg Proops, the only American you can trust. And you're digging showbizmonkeys.com because you're so now. Around this town. I'm all right. Around this town. I'm all right. I mean, no consequence when you're playing with the fire. Move to the left. Man. I think I've only got you for 15 minutes, so forgive me for just jumping right into it. Let's get it on. First off, George Carlin said that he didn't really find his voice until he recorded uh, Jammin' in New York and uh, Back in Town, like, way later. Do you feel with your podcast that you've kind of come into your own, or did you just find a medium that suited you best? Well, I've been able to talk about whatever I wanted on um, stage for a long time as a stand-up. But I felt like uh, doing the podcast was an even more immediate way to reach people because it's a weekly affair, and I don't have to be necessarily swinging to the fences every minute. I can talk about things that are important to me, feminism, history, politics, fighting neo-Nazis, and the whole enchilada. So it's a combo platter uh, of what you ask, Andrew. I, I think I'd already come into my own as far as finding my voice, but I was able to amplify it with the podcast in a way that I never was with stand-up. And... I also don't have to... The people that come to the podcast are there to see the podcast. There's very few people who have wandered in. Mm -hmm. Whereas with stand-up, sometimes you still get people who are there that haven't the slightest idea of why they're there. They're just at a, a, com a generic comedy event. Comedy, as you know, gets lumped into one big thing. Even though there's divisions in comedy, we're one big Venn diagram. Whereas, like, you would never go to a country concert and halfway through go, I hate this, why don't you play some opera? People who go to a comedy show feel very much empowered to go, I hate your comedy, you're not talking about what I like people to talk about. And uh, I don't play that at all, obviously. You come to see me, you get me. Right. If you don't like it, your comfort zone is marked E-X-I-T. So your podcast is called Smartest Man in the World, and you would know that about you if you took 30 seconds on Google. Do club owners ever still tell you, don't be so smart, or you know, try to rein in your act, or are they buying you for what you are? Well, most club owners are real hip. Um, I've had a couple of things happen in the last year where club owners weren't appreciative of my political talk because some of the rednecks in the crowd objected to it. And that's up to them, you know. It's their club. They can do what they like. But it's also my option to not play there ever again. I was asked by one club that I must change my material before I come back because I, I upset some of the customers. And my response was, I'm not in the habit of writing jokes to make Nazis laugh. <laughs> so that, that was the standoff on that one. So, yes, it does happen, Andrew, but it's not common. Um, most club owners let you say whatever you want and leave it up to the crowd. There's two, you know, there's that idiotic school of being an audience member where people can say things like, why don't you want a comedy house to talk about politics? Why can't they just be funny? Well, that looks George Carlin in the eye, doesn't it? And Richard Pryor and Lily Tomlin and Margaret Cho and uh, Samantha Bee and uh, every million, zillion, billion, jillion comics. The point of comedy is to talk about what's happening. Yeah. So uh, to, to say that there's two separate things, one that's entertaining to you because it doesn't hurt your little Nazi feelings, <laughs> and another is, uh, you know, why wouldn't you want um, rappers to rap about what that is going on now? Why wouldn't you want songwriters to sing about what's happening now? Um, there's plenty of escapism in the world. White people don't want to do anything but escape. So it's kind of up to us to sort of refocus, I think. And I think you've touched on already. I was going to say on the podcast, you talk a lot about being against evil, gross, rich, icky white guys. Um but you're still a comedian who does corporate gigs. So what do you talk about when you're doing a corporate? Um, it depends on what type of corporate gig it is. The last corporate gig I did was with Colin and Brad, and we just did improv. So we didn't really have to, you know, the who's line's a little more breezy, right? Yeah. There might be a one or two mild political jokes in there, but we don't set out to satirize the world, but I certainly get my agenda across no matter what. If someone yells real loud of a thank you for exerting your talk, it's no privilege, you know, and that gets a laugh because everybody understands what's going on. Yeah. But uh, also we live in the world and we have to, we have to earn money. So there's balancing the earning money with also trying to promote causes that uh, are valuable to society, you know. 
you're very well known for browbeating an audience to like win them over. <laughs> that's what you know it has to. That's a lot uh, of Thank you. But uh, do you have a rule of thumb with that? Is there a trick to it? And in the same sense, being that smart but still making yourself accessible? Well, I mean, you know, I don't think I'm coming in so high that no one gets me. I'm not there to be esoteric and uh, unreachably ethereal. I am there to communicate on a direct basic level, which means in the stand-up show, jokes. And jokes require connection. If you don't connect on the joke and the joke doesn't land, they're not going to get you or dig you. So if you come to me to stand-up, you'll see that I do get lots of laughs. But I'm not above telling the audience they should read more or that they should know more. And I think that's important, too. I think it was H.L. Mencken who said, you should write above the reader's intelligence. I don't want to aim at the bottom. I'm not, there's plenty of comics you do, man. I mean, without naming any names, mm-hmm. I'm sure because you're a comedy fan, you could name 20 comics off the top of your head, Canadian and American, that mm-hmm. aim right at the middle. They want to hit a bullseye every time. It's easy to do. Uh, I just, that doesn't interest me as much, I think, is my rule of thumb. And mm-hmm. two, crowds really love being beat up a little bit. I had a club owner in Houston say to me years ago, you know that Houston, we have a problem or whatever. He goes, all you do is piss on them, and they love you for it. Your wife is also a huge part of the podcast, if not an equal partner in terms of like content. So I guess what I'm wondering is how has she changed you as a performer for the better? How do you think me as a performer, Jennifer? She just laughed. Um, I think she's made me more aware of personal politics, of what men act like what a woman gets from the world, what the world is treating women like. I think she's hipped me to all of that a lot more. She's alerted me to when I'm being a sexist idiot. She's alerted (laughs) me to when I'm being gross. She's alerted me to when I'm um, doing sexual assault humor that's not funny. She's alerted me to the history of women. Um, Also, she's an expert on jazz and art and film. So uh, that's really turned the podcast into another animal. We have a, another podcast called the Greg Proof Film Club, and she is the curator of that, basically. I, I have picked three or four films over the last five years, but she mm-hmm. usually she's in all the movies. So I find that she's pretty much right about everything, and so I try to let that be my, my guide. I think the problem with a lot of people in the world, and you've seen it this week in high bloody relief, with show business, our Supreme Court, and everything like that, is that men do not listen to women. They just can't hear them. They can't hear them say no. They can't hear them have an opinion. If women express their opinion, they're angry. You know, that's a real big issue in the world. I've tried to evolve, uh, and I think it's, you know, in a great part because if she's sort of told me that I need to evolve in that area and understand. I mean, look at our... Or, you know, Orange 45. He's never listened to a woman in his life. He doesn't listen to women. They don't exist. They are either trophies or bimbos or sex workers or playboy playmates or hot girls or busy pageant people he can walk in on. You notice no one he's put forward to the Supreme Court's been a woman, whereas you may have noticed Bill Clinton and Barack Obama put women on the Supreme Court. We've seen the president of CBS and the producer of 60 Minutes here in the States have to resign their jobs this week because they felt it was within their purview to assault women constantly and deny women their careers and that that was their job description and that they were entitled to it and that they were also entitled to make millions of dollars for doing that. And I think that's what's changing about the world. I'm hoping that they did. You've also been married for a long time and you're on the road a lot. Do you have advice about a long-distance relationship, like how to keep that working? Well, I don't know what advice there is to give. A lot of people ask me this, and it's like, I think you have to be in love with the person you're with. That's a good start. A lot of people get married for a lot of crappy reasons. And in LA, of course, people get married for no reason. And they're married for two weeks and stuff like that. Yeah. Part of it is that Jennifer and I have been together since we were um, struggling, starving, poor people living in another city. So citizens had nothing to do with our relationship, although I was already a performer and she was already an artist. It's a... Uh, I think it's when people get married for money or other reasons mm-hmm. that the trouble begins. And then they, they don't think that being committed to a person is important, and it is. So, uh, you know, I'd say uh, keep the other person in your heart. 
on a lighter tone, just to give you a few lightning round questions. <laughs> Is it true that you got Doug Benson started on his love affair with weed? Doug you, claims that. Do you think you can smoke him under the table? Wow. No, okay. Well, it's a two-parter, so let me address yeah. the first part. And she claims that it was in 1989 or 90, maybe 91, we were playing San Diego together, which I remember. It's a club that's not there anymore. It was on Garnet and Civic Beach called the Improv. And we were watching MTV um, Beach Party every day and laying on the couch. And then we'd go to the beach, which was a couple blocks away. If you can imagine Doug and I at the beach. And uh, we would smoke pot all day. And he claimed that was the first time that he really got high a lot. The second part, um, a couple years ago, we were in Portland doing Doug's show. And we were outside, as he does before the show. As you know, people convene to get hot before the show, mm-hmm. which, of course, I am always a part of. And uh, a guy brought one of those dab machines, you know, that, that can explode. The dab is like bringing a live torpedo with you, right? You have to light a torch, and you pee this thing of wax, and it's a bit complicated for me. But the kids love it. If you do one, it's a real supercharged high. Like, I can do one and still hold my back together. After one or two... You gotta know your limit on this, right? And Dan yeah. did, oh, I don't know, eight, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he put it on, right? So when the show started, he was kind of drifty. And I said, Doug, we need you. This is your show. You have to conduct this. So I don't know if it's a matter of I can smoke him under the table. It's a matter of, uh, he, his tolerance is um, fairly astronomical, I would say. Is it the Bootsy Collins level? Yeah, that was very diplomatic uh, uh, of you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love him like a brother, and I've worked with him for a hundred years, so he's been one of the nicest people to me in the entire comedy world. Um, and the truth is, you know, you've been around it enough. We, we actually do all like each other. There's only a few people we all fucking hate or whatever. Okay. One of my favorite things on the show that you don't do as much anymore, so I want to ask you about it. Have you been planning any more art heists in your head lately? Uh, yeah, I love that part of the show, too. Yeah, we are, actually. Uh, Jennifer and I are going to Paris in the um, a- in Christmas time, and uh, I'm thinking about knocking over the Moreau Museum. And I think <laughs> you, it's what you take one of the small pieces from the drawer, and you sail it out the window, and then you have to have a Confederate downstairs uh, in a taxi cab, because I think Paris has banned Ubers, so there's no way to make an Uber escape in France. So this one has to be rethought a little bit. But the Moreau Museum has actual, like, lithographs and, 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 and drawings and pencil sketches inside drawers. And I think that's the way to do it. Either that or step it up under your overcoat because it's the winter and then pretend to have a tubercular shit and roll down the stairs. Fantastic. Showbizmonkeys.com